I'm Gerilyn Witchers, reporter with the Manitoba Cooperator, and I love cats. Instagram knows I love cats, so its algorithm spits out posts and posts of those fuzzy buggers. I couldn't tell you exactly how they do it. I know they follow me around the internet and collect data on me. That's the price I pay for free access to Instagram and fluffy, fluffy cat pics. That's relatively common knowledge, I think, thanks to snafus like the Cambridge Analytica scandal back in 2018. We know that tech companies sell our data for purposes both banal and nefarious. But does that apply to agriculture tech companies? Author and researcher Kelly Bronson says yes. But the way we talk about agricultural data gets in the way of us seeing it. We'll hear from her in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors. Maybe you've had an idea about upgrading your operation. Maybe about finally getting that renovation done or buying some new equipment. Or maybe you're thinking about how you can be a bit more financially secure from season to season. Get some help making it happen by speaking with an RBC Agriculture Account Manager. Then set up an investment plan to make even more of your ideas happen. Visit rbc.com backslash chart your course and get started today. Dr. Kelly Bronson is the Canada Research Chair in Science and Society at the University of Ottawa. She recently wrote a book where she examines the way we talk about data. We treat it almost like a mystical material untouched by human hands that has the ability to solve all our problems. She calls it the Immaculate Conception of Data. So so the Immaculate Conception, just as you say, is a way of thinking about talking about data as if data were just a natural resource, raw, pulled from the ground, that that doesn't then make visible or it works to invisibilize all of the people and the human decision making that go into deciding which datum to collect in the first place on which variables and then you know all of the other decisions how those data sets get structured and how they get used for whose benefit and so you know while all of the amazing, you know, data scientists from both public and private sector sector I spent time with in the course of writing the book. I'm sure they wouldn't if I said to the, you know, nobody would actually say, oh, that there is such thing as an immaculately conceived datum. Right. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, if pressed, adhere to that framework. They would say, of course, you know, I I myself I saw I witnessed them doing that that work, right? The very difficult and messy work of collecting those data and trying to get the farm tools to work in many cases they weren't working perfectly and um but but yet it's this really dominant way that not even in the ag sector alone but i think you'll start to notice like everywhere we talk about data this way and the it, i i i sort of came to see that there's a power in that kind of framework, right? And it connects to these long-standing ideas we have about technology and what technologies can do for society. I mean, even that language, right? Technologies don't do anything. Humans do things with tools and it's humans who design the tools in the first place. And and yet we we have this really long-standing way of talking about technology as if it drives history, right? And does these amazing things, progress, et cetera. And, and so it's this really powerful framework, right? I came to see that people were using it, right? Like in their pitch <laughs> at a data convention, or I came to see that even like activist farmers who are working against, you know, some of the issues in our food system, like unequal power between corporations and farmers, they were still participating in you talking about data this way. And I came to see that that it's it's really helpful, right? It's it's really great to talk about data as the next thing. And we're it's you know, driving us toward this bright, shiny future called Farm 4.0. And isn't it going isn't it gonna be great? And even if your idea of Farm 4.0 looks totally different if you're an activist scientist versus a scientist working for Bayer Monsanto, right? And that was like that thing with the first two chapters or chapter two and chapter three, right? It's like, if you're in the private sector, you probably think that farm 4.0 looks like 
fewer and fewer farmers and bigger and bigger farms and machinery driving itself, <laughs> farmers being able to farm from anywhere and who needs farmers anyway? Um, and farm work is this drudgery and isn't automation either like if it's an artificial intelligence replacing a farmer's decision-making or whether it's an actual robot replacing lab, you know, mechanical labor. Um, so that's sort of like the, that might be one vision for this farm 4.0. And then the activists I spent time with who are just as, as enthused about data have a totally different version of farm 4.0, which is open data and open science and these really close-knit communities for community supported agriculture or community food sovereignty. So, you know, with farmers working the land, but just sort of um, enabled by technologies like data technology. Anyway, they have radically different visions of the future. And yet they both see that data are the future and taking us toward the future. And, and the whole reason I write around this, this framework, which you said, you know, might not be it's it's maybe a bit well it's difficult right when you have these really dominant ways of talking about things or thinking about things to point out the things that are most obvious <laughs> sometimes that's really difficult work but the reason i wrote the whole book around the immaculate conception of data in a way was because i think it's really part of what's preventing many of us from seeing that in agriculture just like in other contexts right? There are really powerful interests behind <laughs> the collection of data and the use and misuse of data. And mm -hmm. so if we, if we continue to talk about data as if they're natural, right, then we don't really interrogate, oh, wait a second, who's collecting that data? And what, you know, what are the, we can't really peek behind the curtains of the data science and the, um, and the, the corporate uses of data. In her research, Kelly talked to big agribusiness companies and to, as she calls them, activist farmers, smaller scale farmers with non-corporate ideals. I asked her, if both groups have such different viewpoints, why did they both use the immaculate conception of data viewpoint? She suggested this is because it connects to this long-standing idea that technology drives progress and improves society. I can say that why do I think that these really different social groups that I spent time with in the context of writing this book, right, the people working in private sector, the data scientists working for John Deere or for Bayer Monsanto, the big corporate farmers using these systems, and then, yeah, these like small activist farmers who were, you know, doing um, work for small agricultural systems and what we might say alternative agricultural systems, why do they all participate in talking about data this way? Well, I, I mean, as I say in the book, you know, it, it's I you have to think of the framework not as necessarily a false view, even though it is like, it, you know, technologies don't do anything on their own. <laughs> and there are lots of people behind the technologies. But, but talking about um, technologies, and in this case, in data and data agricultural projects this way is a really powerful way of talking about it, right? It, it's like, I, I saw it work to like turn, you know, people around and bring people, enlist people in the support, right? At a convention, right? If you say like, this is the future and data are going to get us there. Or the, usually the framing is, this is this big problem we have in agriculture. And so if you're, if you're a company and you're selling your technology to a large grain farmer in the Midwest, it's look at the problem of agricultural labor, right? finding enough laborers, look at the drudgery of being on the farm. And wouldn't you want to like, you know, Wade Barnes, the head of Farmer's Edge, in one of his pitches said, you can, in the future, you'll be able to farm from anywhere. You can fish while you farm, right? You can be on vacation with your family and be farming because automation is going to replace the farmer. And so it, you know, it's part of the pitch so activist scientists told me, like, we've got all sorts of problems in agriculture, but if we just have open data projects and, you know, we're going to have this bright, shiny future, which for them, again, is this like community food sovereignty and alternative agriculture, not the not the big corporate agricultural model. But so so for everyone, it was part of the pitch, basically. Right. I think they're participating in 
reproducing these, again, longstanding ways of talking about technology and society in this context, right, talking about data and agriculture, because it really works, right? In this, in a context where, right, humans we know make really flawed decisions <laughs> in a context where like across the board all we have is really fraught and tense like political discourse and you know and politicians who we probably can't trust and hey we corporations we can't trust and but data if they're immaculate if they came down from on high right they're objective and therefore they're powerful right they're outside of all these interests and they're going to solve all of the problems we have so whether the problem is feeding the world by 2050 so that's how like the world bank would talk about these technologies right we need to feed the world and therefore we need data driven agriculture or you know bear monsanto might also say it's about feeding the world or about sustainability or if they're you know, trying to sell their technology to a farmer in a corporate ad, they might say it's about farm labor, right? And allowing you to farm from anywhere, or it's about competitive advantage, right? Risk management, I think. Risk management, well. exactly. So, so it's it's part of the pitch, right? Um, it's it's much it's a much better sell to say, you know, let's get outside of all the messiness of human decision making. Data are going to take us to bright shiny future no matter what that future is for those of us who use twitter facebook google and so forth it's not a surprise to hear those companies are collecting data from us we might not think about it or like it, but we know it's happening and that it's being used probably to sell us something. By comparison, while I knew that modern farm equipment, for instance, collects data all the time, I knew far less about what happens to it. I asked Kelly, have I been living under a rock? No, I don't think you have. And 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 that's really why I wrote the whole book around that framework, because... I think that it's really, it was really curious to me, like the book started out, as I say in the intro chapter, but as like, I just thought, oh, we need some research on, you know, who's collecting data and what's being done with those data and a kind of description of, of, of what was happening, right, in the ag sector around the collection and uses of what's called big data. And, and then it turned into, and it is that on one level. But then, you know, the immaculate conception of data, it the book turned into, wait a second, when I started to really look, why is, why is no, why does it seem at least like there isn't really that much attention, both scholarly at the time, it's still basically true and in the scholarly domain, but certainly popularly, why is there not, as you say, you know, widespread knowledge and kind of not dissent necessarily, but at least suspicion around the uses and potential misuses of personal data in the agricultural realm. Because I just didn't see it, you know, and I, it was really curious to me on the heels of what seemed to be this grand kind of dissent around Facebook, right, and big tech, and like a tech lash, you know, mostly because of their, the enormous profiting right off of the the data that we create through our online behavior. And there was Cambridge Analytica scandal right around not just the profiting, but also the misuses of those data for psyops and rigging, right? Elections, both in the US and the Brexit election. And so on the heels of all of that kind of, you know, tech lash that centers on data and internet data, I wondered, well, like, why isn't anyone making any noise or looking into data collected in the agricultural realm or domain. And I just didn't see it. And I still don't really see it, to be honest. Um, and, and so the book makes this argument that partly it's that there's this framework for talking about data that's not helping us really look into the interests, I might call it, right? Whether it's economic interest, I mean, that's largely it behind the collection of agricultural data and it is weird because as you say you know there is 
suspicion, even among the, the farmers who buy Bayer Monsanto seed systems, right, around corporate interest and oversight and but it doesn't seem to really it hasn't really blown up yet (laughs) is it because there haven't been the same level of scandal i think that's exactly it i think that what's going to happen is this is i mean if we think about facebook right it's not like i mean there's been some regulatory um leadership especially in the european union around data and corporate power, like they have the GDPR and some regulatory levers for sort of trying to manage how data get collected, or at least create transparency for ordinary people around how data are being collected or which data are being collected. But I think we only really have that. There's hardly any really regulation still of those corporations and what they do with data. And the only things we really know about and are because, as you say, of scandals or leakages like Cambridge Analytica or so I think that with agriculture, I suspect the same thing is going to happen. We're just further behind that this is sort of going to be worked out in the court of public opinion in the future. Part of the intervention I wanted to make was, hey, you know, unlike social media, this is kind of a new thing, right? These former chemical and then life science corporations are just starting to, I think, become data corporations. And why don't we try to figure out right now what is being done and in the regulatory or policy space, what ought to be done, right? Have a kind of conversation now about who should get compensated for data collection and, you know, what can be done with data. And because I think there's an opening for us to do something about it now before before we have those major scandals like have happened with social media data. So what's being done with that data? Sales is the obvious one, but that's not the only draw for ag companies. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think what really cheeses a lot of people is not just that the data are used to sell us stuff. I mean, some people probably appreciate those targeted ads and those sometimes. algorithms. And right. Sometimes they kind yeah. of get you get you right. Right. In their psychological um, um, construction of your of of your needs and desires. but. But I think what most people really resent, at least I can speak for myself, is that, you know, it's that the data collection then, you know, is used to create aggregate data sets, which by the companies collecting the data are sold as an asset, right, to the jeans company who's trying to sell you a pair of blue jeans or to the, (laughs) I have an anxiety necklace and this was a targeted ad, right? Like, and so... It's not so much that you're being advertised to, but you know that behind that is a very, very profitable data set, right? That was sold to this, you know, anxiety necklace company, or they paid for access to the data set more likely. And it's that assetization and the incredible money that's made off of our behavior online, right? Um it, which I think cheeses a lot of people. And then, you know, that money turns into incredible power such that these large cor- corporations can operate beyond the purview of nation, you know, national regulation, et cetera. You know, I think it's Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon together have twice the wealth of all African nations. Like, that's just absurd. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, so, and but that same, I mean, I wrote an article, an academic article this year about this, kind of what are some of the, because it's a bit of a difficult gig, as you say, it's not really people haven't started to talk about this happening in the agricultural context. And it doesn't seem the risks don't seem as immediately um, apparent, right? I think people just assume, oh, farm environments, like that's just, that's, I mean, it's just data on crops, what can be done with those data? First of all, it's not just data on crops, right? It's personal data too. So the tractors, for example, the eight series tractors from John Deere, the precision equipment, they collect data on hundreds of variables, including the farmer right? From the the time that the cab door gets opened. So it's personal data, like social media. Some of it is. It's on farm laborers and... What kind of personal data about the farmer can Like movement of the workers, like, you know, when the worker's coming in and out, how they're using the tractor. How many breaks they take. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Which can help if you're a large manager, right? An operator and you have more than one vehicle and you have farm workers and it's a way for you to kind of police or, or manage your farm laborers. But 
you know, collects data on the equipment, et cetera. But I think it's it's also just similar to the social media context. It's that these data sets can be, I mean, I'm sure they are. We know they are because there have been a few watchdog organizations like ETC Group that have found years ago right legal agreements about data, data transfer between John Deere and Monsanto. This was before the acquisition or the consol- consolidation, the Bayer Monsanto merger, sorry. And so we know that data are being transferred and, and those data sets are being sold. And so, right, there's that same kind of, hey, wait a second, this isn't fair. There's that same injustice, I would say. And maybe even more so, because as we know, in the agricultural context, unlike social media, the farmers who are paying John Deere through, you know, for access to data-driven advice, the decision platform, if they buy into my farm manager, they're paying with their data, data that the company is going to make money off of, and they're paying to access insights from those data. So they're paying twice. So there's that same issue of like what we might call incommensurate benefit, right? The company is to stand to make real money from personal data, data that the farmers are helping to collect. So that's one issue that's very similar, I would say, to social media. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then you're right, then the companies can use those data. They're going to sell, you know, companies collecting the data can sell those data, data sets. The data sets become an asset. Um, so it's another way for them to make money. And we all know that no matter how large a farmer you are, there's, you know, it's difficult to farm. <laughs> there's no money in primary production, really unless you're one of those big corporations. So even if you like John Deere and you're a John Deere person, you probably still, no matter how large your farm, know that, heck, John Deere Corporation is turning a much bigger profit than you are as a commodity grower. And so there's that, there's that, there's that issue, right? That it's not fair that the companies stand to make even more money in a situation where we know that agribusinesses make a lot of money in the food system relative to farmers. But then, you know, then we can guess about how those data are going to be used. So to sell us stuff, sure. But if you think then about more carefully about that, and we don't know, and I say this in the book in chapter five, I wanted to get um, research this question exactly. How are the data being used for whose gain, right? Or to whose gain, whose benefit? And I, you can't, you can't, right? It's all locked under legal mechanisms, license and use agreements by trade secrecy law. No one would talk to me about this, except when I looked at financial documents, you can make inferences. So we know that companies talk to other companies and they talk to investors saying, hey, data are a real revenue, a future revenue stream, right? So we know that the companies are going to make money off of the data themselves. But we also can infer based on past behavior. So we know that companies like chemicals companies have used price discrimination historically, right? So they've, you know, they're so big, again, you know, there's only a small handful of input suppliers that they can basically operate outside of the economic forces of supply and demand, right? They basically set prices, And we know that corporations have done this. And we know, for example, that even like a fuel company, right, Um, or um, a fossil fuel company, the NFU has these beautiful graphs where, you know, you show like a slight increase in a commodity price (laughs) one year, and then the price of fuel, right, tracks that increase, or the price of like chemical inputs tracks that increase. And so you can see... Um, and I forget what, where the NFU has those graphs and what reporting, but they've, they've charted it beautifully using these visual statistics that show that basically the input suppliers increase the prices at the absolute threshold, like, you know, that farmers can pay and they increase them based on, you know, fluctuations in the commodities market, for example, such that any extra profit a farmer was going to make, oh, it's gone already, right? Mm-hmm. It's then gone to the input supplier. And so we can assume if, if these corporations have used price discrimination in the past, data analytics are just giving them another window to be able to write more information to set prices. So for example, and this is inference, but again, it's based on past behavior. So I think it's quite well-reasoned and logical. You know, if if um, if Mon- Bear Monsanto can predict in a particular region based on data analytics, right, gathered over a series of precision tractors, that there's going to be a particular need for a certain chemical, right, then they can set that price. 
-hmm. We also can infer that it might be used by reinsurance companies. I think that's a really logical, and I write about that in the book. So I think we don't know, basically, and we don't know because these are these data sets and the algorithms used to derive advice and what is actually happening with the data and who's benefiting, it's all protected by legal mechanisms. So a critical researcher like myself can't peek behind the curtain, but Mm -hmm. we can guess based on past behavior. I asked Kelly if she's against things like precision agriculture, which relies on data. Does she see potential for data collection to do good? So again, I'm not down on precision agriculture or the potential of digital tools by no means, Mm -hmm. right? But, and and, you know, one of the things as you say that it could be great if, if large industrial farmers could reduce their inputs, right? Of harmful or scarce resources like water, harmful inputs like chemicals, right? And scarce inputs like water. If they could use a kind of precision analytics to do that and variable rate, great. Part one argument to be made is that that's still just an amendment, right, of of the current system. So it's not really broader, I would argue, brought the kind of broader change that I think we know is necessary, right? Um, in that, you know, currently agriculture on aggregate in Canada contributes one third of greenhouse gas emissions. Like, are we going to do we need to tweak this <laughs> or do we need to radically rethink this? I guess is the question. And I'm in the latter camp. I think we need to radically rethink this. But I think the second problem is that, right, we know that a lot of the problems, as you say, with industrial agriculture are not just technical problems, right? But they're wrapped up in the political economy and in the justice issues, right? Mm-hmm. We We know that that the model has favored not just bigger and fewer farmers, but a grand inequity between agribusinesses and farmers. And for all of the reasons we mentioned before, the reasons that we should look at agriculture like we do social media, right? Those same powerful corporations stand to benefit enormously through this new technical system that is big data and data analytics. And if they stand to become even more concentrated and even more powerful, I think that in itself creates a host of social and environmental problems in this system. What the book doesn't really go into is what to do, how to escape this idea of the immaculate conception of data. I could hardly ask questions without using very immaculate sounding phrases like data driven agriculture, as if data has the ability to jump up and drive a tractor or something. We started out kind of just by talking about what the immaculate conception of data is. I'd like to end by asking, if not that, then what? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, such a good question. How should yeah. people how? Enable to think about data and, and yeah. digitally driven agriculture? No, it's such a good question. And I had given it some thought, even though I didn't write about it. I know I did that really annoying thing where I'm like, this is the wrong way to think about it. And I don't give us much of a where we need to go. But I think for one, we just need to watch our linguistic practices. Again, not just in agriculture, but more broadly, right? Just really catch ourselves instead of describing data driven and raw data and right, instead of describing technologies as if they're natural resources pulled from the ground or as if they came from God on high, right? Really create in our language and in our analytical practices or the ways we think and talk and in the research that we do, really create visibility around the people and I would call it the interests, right? Around data practices. So really as really make space for asking questions like, wait a second, why collect data on that variable and not this other one? And is that going to be a private data set? And, you know, if a farmer helped collect that data set, where did that, where does that data go and who benefits from it? Should the farmer share in some of those data benefits? So really create visibility around, you know, the, the, the back end, right, of these data systems, who's collecting the data and then where the data are going and who, who's really benefiting from them. Um, So I think it's sort of a matter of language and just thinking really carefully and critically about, about what's done. And, but then at the same time, also maybe stepping way back again, outside of thinking of technologies as the driving force for societal progress and starting to ask about, 
ask the broader questions like, wait a second, what kind of food system or what kind of society do we want in the first place? And then how might new technological projects help us get there, if at all, right? Maybe we have other ways of organizing our lives or other kinds of levers besides just investing in shiny new things that can help us get to where we want to go. You've been listening to my conversation with author and professor Kelly Bronson. If you'd like to learn more, you can read her book. It's called The Immaculate Conception of Data. This has been another episode of Between the Rows with me, your cat lady host, Gerilyn Witchers. It was produced by Bruce Thorson. Thanks for listening. Maybe you had an idea about upgrading your operation. Maybe about finally getting that renovation done or buying some new equipment. Or maybe you're thinking about how you can be a bit more financially secure from season to season. Get some help making it happen by speaking with an RBC Agriculture Account Manager. Then, set up an investment plan to make even more of your ideas happen. Visit rbc.com backslash chart your course and get started today.